Okay, well, welcome everybody to this afternoon's um, COVID press uh, briefing. My name is Councillor Matt Golby. Um, I'm very proud to be the Cabinet Member for Public Health and Adult Social Care in the West, uh, New West, North Hans, uh, Council. Um, I'm joined by my colleague, um, Councillor Helen Harrison, who's the, um, my opposite number in the North. We've got a number of people on the line who are experts um, from the different services, and I'll just run down those in a middle in a minute um, and we'll um, go down and um, have a, a little introduction from most of the members of the panel and then we will take some of the questions that are pre-submitted so i'll just run down because i think it'd be pretty difficult to um, do a virtual round the room so on our panel today we've got lucy whiteman who's the director of public health in northamptonshire we've got deborah needham who's the Chief Executive Officer for Kettering General Hospital. We've got Anne Dorothy, who's the Deputy Director for the COVID-19 Vaccination Programme. We've got Elliot Foskett, who's the Superintendent from Northamptonshire Police. We've got Dr. Joanne Watt, who's the GP Chair for Northamptonshire Clinical Commissioning Group. Um, I'm Councillor Matt Golby. There's Councillor Helen Harrison. We've got a couple of other uh, comms colleagues on the call, and we've also got um, Paul Andrews from the COVID School Cell. So without any further ado, we'll go straight to Lucy for the first um, session of um, information from you, Lucy, if that's okay. Thank you very much, Councillor Golby, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. It feels like quite a big gap since we last all spoke, so I'm keen, obviously, to give you the latest information. Um, please do remember that obviously we update this surveillance pack on a weekly basis and you can access it as always through the County Council website which remains in place to ensure that people can find the right information when they need it as well as both of the new unitary councils. So the headlines this week, um, we are sadly seeing an increase in our case rates locally. Um, at this point in time, I'm pleased to say that it's not a significant spike as we've seen in other areas, but all the same, it is clearly a warning sign of potential things to come if we don't remember to be compliant and obviously make sure that we familiarise ourselves with the changing rules. And household transmission does still continue to be the number one cause of transmission, despite even those changes in in some of our uh, restrictions in recent weeks. The largest number of cases has been again in the 10 to 19 year olds and we do recognise that in part is a symptom of the fact that they are regularly engaging with testing uh, but we have seen a change in that the second largest number of cases is now in the 20 to 29 year olds. Historically that's been in the 30 to 39 year olds for quite some time and we'll talk about why that might be as we get into the report proper. But just to note, there is still significant variation in case rates across the county, and we will look at some of the reasons for that as we go through. So if we just quickly go on to the first slide, we'll just remind ourselves of some of the changes. Um, obviously, we didn't see the full removal of lockdown restrictions as we had hoped for Monday, but we have seen some changes. So it is worth noting of that four week delay, and that is primarily due to one of those four tests not being met, which was you know, the assessment of risk has fundamentally changed because of a new variant of concern that we obviously now know as Delta. So we are obviously keeping in very close contact with Public Health England and central government with regard to the plans, but we do not expect an announcement obviously before the 17th of July at this point in time. On the next slide though, some restrictions have obviously changed and I'm pleased to say that there has been some limited easing of rules, primarily around life events. So wedding civil services and um, partnerships, uh, funerals, etc. So please do make sure that you familiarise yourself with those, but it does at least give some people who have been having to delay some of these really important events some opportunity to celebrate them in a way that they had hoped. If we move on. So one of the things that we're acutely aware of, obviously, is um, we've got uh, the football on at the moment, include, including a very important match this evening. But it is one of those things that we do really need to remind people about, particularly when quite often we'll go and watch uh, those football matches in a social setting. Um, and when we have a drink, we sometimes do forget, or when we're celebrating something, that we do still have to try and adhere to those rules around the numbers that we're mixing with, but also obviously social distancing wherever possible. So we've obviously developed a number of resources just to remind people not to get caught offside, you know, to help um, blow the full-time whistle on COVID, et cetera, because we want to see these final restrictions lifted as soon as possible. 
So if we move on, if we go to slide eight, if that's okay, that first data slide. And obviously please do remember you've got all of that information in the pack about how to access testing, et cetera, should you need it there. But importantly, this obviously gives us a bit of a picture as to where we are at the moment. And as I said, we've had that increase again on our case rates last week. And this is data up to the 13th of June. So just recognizing that there is that slight delay in reporting. This is a continued trend, I would point out, though we're not seeing any improvement on the position in the last few days. And obviously in that week up to the 13th of June, we saw another 303 cases. Um, and that is a 21% increase just on that previous week. So if we go on to the next slide. So from the point of view of actual case rates, because obviously this allows us to compare areas with areas, you can still see that broadly, both the East Midlands and also locally, we do thankfully still remain either similar or a bit lower than the national rate. But I have to caveat that with the fact that that's not because we're not seeing those case rates increase. We absolutely are. It's just that they're not increasing as steeply as they are in the rest of England. And therefore, actually, England's case rate is escalating at a much faster rate. So this is primarily due to the fact that we have got a lot of the Delta variant present. In England as a whole, it is the, now the, the dominant variant. In Northamptonshire at this point in time, it's certainly dominant from the data that we've got around the genotyping in the east and the south of the county. But we are seeing a rising proportion of cases across the other areas too. I think one of the things to note as well in the last couple of weeks, those who have kept up to date with these weekly releases, is that there's been a, a shift we, you know, historically since Christmas have had real challenges in the north of the county and you can see from these case rates that actually it's the west that is being more heavily affected at this point in time. In particular Northampton, but then very similar rates in both Daventry and South Northampton. Northampton there obviously statistically significantly higher than the actual rate for the county. So if we move on. Thank you. So obviously here's just an illustration of how that's changed over time, but you can really see that steep increase in that dotted grey line, which is the England average shooting up in the last few weeks. And again, variation in our borough and district areas. But again, you can still see that our dashed Northamptonshire average is on the move upwards, although not as steeply as the England average. But the variation in, in the sort of pattern and the direction of travel for different areas is really quite marked there. Obviously, particularly the one that stands out is the Northampton change in recent weeks. Um, but also some areas are starting to um, obviously plateau, which is really good news. And we want to encourage that continued uh, patterns of behaviour. If we move on just quickly to the crude numbers. So again, 303 cases in that week, um, small numbers um, in some areas, absolutely only 19 cases in Corby. That's really, really good news. It is still, however, an increase on the previous week. So although we recognise that some people will feel this is a small risk because we're talking in some places about small numbers, you know, we still do have to recognise that with the increased transmissibility of this particular variant, that actually we are you know, up to 60 times more likely or 60% more transmissible than the previous alpha variant. And therefore that number could you know, really quite escalate quickly. If we move on. So again, this is just demonstrating the fact that we are very much on an upward increase trajectory. So all of those bars that are above the zero line demonstrate a, an increase. This data goes up to uh, um, the 10th of June and therefore you can obviously see on a day-to-day -day basis there is some fluctuation, but we still are very much on the upward increase. Can we move on please? So here's the really interesting part. So we do know, as I said, that this is in part an artifact of the fact that we test very regularly in schools and we're really grateful for the school's input into that supported um, process and also all of the school communities, the parents and all of the carers engaging in that process. It is very much helping us keep on top of making sure that those settings remain open and also obviously making sure that we isolate as soon as possible to limit the onward spread within those groups. But what's interesting here, as I've said before, is we've now seen a shift to the 20 to 29 year olds uh, being the second largest group from a point of view of crude count of cases. 
The good thing here is we have got an equal distribution of males and females and um, you know most things would affect uh, both genders equally and that demonstrates also that we've had an increased uptake in testing in males which is a really positive thing and every time we find someone positive as much as obviously that is playing into some of the decisions central government's having to make it also means that you know assuming that person is compliant which we'd obviously want them to be that they are then going to be stopping passing that on to somebody else and this is the only way that we're going to start to bend this trend once more if we just move on to the next slide Again, this is a good news story, um, and I won't say too much about it um, from a point of view of we've seen a, a relatively low rate of um, admissions, but it, again, it is a slightly changed story. So I'm sure Deborah will give us a little bit more detail about what it's feeling like and looking like both COVID and non-COVID related uh, activity in the hospitals in a second. But if we just move on to the next slide. The one benefit here, and this is you know, very much directly related to the lockdown impact and also the vaccination impact, is that we have not seen any deaths. We are, as you've seen before, um, seeing that real static um, numbers in relation to the over 60s who have typically been those most affected by um, mortality, sadly. Um, we do want to obviously just reinforce the fact that it is both doses of the vaccination that's required to have the most uh, coverage and, and chance of sort of limiting any impact of catching COVID in all age groups. Um, and indeed, some of the admissions that we have seen have been in that younger age group who either haven't taken up the opportunity for vaccination or indeed up until today have not been offered the opportunity to have that vaccine. And that thankfully is starting to change. So if we just lastly have a quick look at the outbreak position. So again, we've always got the maps of, of the areas most affected. Again, this is a bit of a good news story, um, but it's down to all of the hard work of the businesses and of all of the employees. And again, our environmental health officer colleagues, uh, the police, et cetera. You know, this is about compliance. Um, this is about um, the effect of vaccination and to some extent um, lockdown, but obviously that, that's less so now that we've seen those restrictions being lifted. What we haven't seen is a significant number of outbreaks. So you can see very, very small numbers here. It was only you know, maybe three months ago that we were talking about the number of outbreaks being sort of, sort of between 40 and 60 a week. And again, people also note, apart from the exception of, of one education setting, that actually where those outbreaks happen, they are typically in now smaller numbers. Again, just demonstrating that if you're compliant, as soon as you're found to be positive, that you reduce that onward spread. But in the member of these settings are doing regular testing, which helps identify the potential outbreak early. Um, and obviously a lot of the people affected um, and working in these areas will have also received their vaccinations. So definitely a good news story, definitely evidence of the fact that what we're doing works as and when people do remember the restrictions and take up the opportunity for testing and vaccination whenever they can. So I will stop there, Councillor Bowlby. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. Very good. Thank you. So um, next to present, if that's OK, is Deborah Needham. Um, Deborah, are you OK to speak to the conference. Thank I you. I certainly am. Thank you, yeah. Councillor. Thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to start just with an update on the number of COVID patients we've got across both hospitals in our county. So today we have four patients um, across Northampton General and Kettering General. One of those patients is currently in, uh, in critical care um, and all have been diagnosed as COVID positive. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot of patients, but what I do need to let you know today is that both hospitals, and in fact, GP surgeries also, are incredibly busy at the moment. Um, and what we are starting to see across both hospitals are patients um, that are coming into the into the A E departments um, who have got really minor illness that could be seen by a pharmacist, um, could self-treat at home, things like uh, hay fever, for example. So we've seen patients in the last week present with hay fever. Um, and whilst I appreciate that that may seem serious and severe to the individual who's experiencing the, the effects of that, it certainly doesn't warrant um, either a trip to your GP, unless you can't breathe, uh, or a trip to the emergency department. It is not an accident or an emergency. Um, so my message really today is uh, to, the, to the general public to say, please keep our hospitals free 
of um, patients um, who don't need to be there. Um, please do use other alternatives. So you can contact 111. You can do that either via the internet. Um, it's really quite easily. I did it myself a few weeks back. Um, or you can uh, phone 111 and they will divert you to the, to the right place. Um, what we will be doing across both hospitals over the coming weeks is we will be triaging you at the front door. And what that means is we'll be assessing your needs very quickly and if you can self-care or you can be treated by a pharmacist, for example, at the local Boots, then that's exactly where we will be um, diverting you to rather than seeing you within the A&E department. Um, so I, I think the only thing uh, left for me to say really at this point is uh, we know it's going to be a busy evening tonight. Uh, there's quite an important football match, I believe. So uh, please do be safe. Please do keep to the, uh, the restrictions that are in place. They are there to help you and your family um, and obviously my staff as well um, across Northamptonshire. So uh, thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Thank you very much, Deborah. Some very strong Strong messages there. Thank you. Um, next is Anne Dorothy. Anne, are you okay to um, to carry on? Yes. Uh, thank you, Councillor Goldby. Um, so I'm just going to present a bit of an updated situation on the vaccination program. Um, I think everyone will have heard today, and we're really delighted that the program's now been extended to all adults. Uh, so that's all over the age of um, 18. Um, can now um, either book or be invited for their uh, for their vaccination. Uh, which is a which is a great news story and really does begin the final push um, to protect the country going forward. So the NHS will be sending about one and a half million texts out to people between the ages of um, 18 and 20 um, from today onwards, um, inviting them to come forward. Um, we're obviously ready for some high demand in relation to this. We know we've got um, a big uh, target to reach by the uh, 19th of July and we're absolutely poised and ready for that and have been um, planning for that accordingly. So we know that around eight to ten adults have had their first dose across the country and, um, and about half have had their second dose as well which is having a really positive impact as has been outlined by um, Lucy. Um, so people can continue to book um, via the national booking system or via 111 um, and they will also be invited by uh, their local um, GP practices and primary care services to get a vaccine. Um, just a few key messages and I won't um, run over what Lucy's touched on already but um, but we're really pushing the message hard about the importance of having that second vaccine. Um, obviously, we've got a cohort of the population now being invited to come forward early to have that um, second vaccine. So um, within eight weeks um, of the last one, where they need to have had it um, more than eight weeks ago. Um, and that's going to have the most significant impacts on the Delta variant that we know it, it's really critical to have that second um, vaccine. This really is the way the way out of the pandemic, as, as Lucy said. Um, and we'll also protect people against long COVID. We're seeing more and more people with symptoms of long COVID. Uh, so we'll help that as well. Um, and we know, too, that two doses um, are as effective as uh, as was for the alpha variant. So, uh, so just keep pushing that message, really. Um, so just to go through some of the statistics, so we're over the three quarters of a million vaccinations given across Northamptonshire now. So seven, nearly 781,000 total doses given. Um, a massive achievement and a, and a massive thanks to all the partners and, and providers that supported us to get to that place. Um, 455 and a half thousand have had first doses and 325 um, and a half thousand have had their second doses and even within the last week we've vaccinated 37 and a half thousand people um, so absolutely maintaining and we'll be increasing that pace going forward um, of our 55 year uh, 50 55 year olds plus now, 90% um, plus of those have had a second vaccine. So, um, so our most at risk population of, of are really well protected, which is why we're seeing um, the, the, the data that uh, Lucy shared. Um, so for first doses, uh, we've got 85% uh, of 45 to 49 year olds have had it 
and 87% of 40 to 44 year olds have, have had their first vaccination. And, um, and we're making great strides with the younger cohorts now and seeing those um, figures increase also. Um, so some really good news uh, for, for this week and going into the future is that we started drop-in sessions at the vaccination centre at Moulton Park. Um, so what we know is that the younger population don't always like to plan, don't always like to book in. Um, they quite often prefer to just be able to turn up somewhere. Um, so we're taking a different, more flexible approach to that. And we started offering drop-in sessions yesterday. We've got a drop-in session today. Um, and I'm pleased to announce too that we've got a drop-in session from 5.30 to 7.30 tomorrow evening and on Sunday and on Monday from 12.30 to 7.30 in the evening as well. So loads of opportunity for people to, um, to just arrive for their, for their vaccination at their convenience around the football matches, obviously. Um, what we want to do going forward is to have a plan that every single day we will offer drop-in opportunities here at the VC and we will be publicising that um, from next week. Um, so we've got a great team here who will welcome people through. With the drop-in, um, there, there is a chance that people may have to queue, so we just ask people to turn up prepared. Um, you know, bring your water. Uh, don't have to worry too much about the weather today. It's bring your umbrella as I look outside the window here, but just to, just to come prepared, appropriately dressed and so on. Um, and again, you can still book in. If you prefer to be organised, you can book in via MBS um, or via 111. Um, continue to uh, vaccinate a huge proportion of the population through our local vaccination services and GP practices um, and also through our community pharmacies. So our community pharmacies are playing an increasing role um, in helping to vaccinate the county. Uh, we've got a new centre opening at the Raven Hotel within the next couple of weeks, um, which provides more opportunity again for people in, um, in Corby to ensure that, um, that they get their vaccination too. So, um, so making sure there's as much flexibility, both booked and drop-in um, opportunity going forward as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Some brilliant, um, brilliant performance there. Excellent. Um, so next we've got Elliot Foskett from Northampton Police. Elliot, are you okay? Councillor, thank you. Councillor, I hope you can hear me. Thank you. Yes, yeah. I'm very good. Uh, it's been a while since I've been on this call, um, but it's really good to see so many familiar faces. Uh, so from a policing point of view, reports of COVID breaches, i.e. those breaches that members of the public phone in to tell us about, have dropped uh, steadily and we've seen a, a real decline in the number of people calling us now. Uh, um, I think 136 breaches have been reported to us since 17th of May. Now if you think back at the peak of what we were dealing with when I used to come on here before, we were looking at around, uh, certainly in the first lockdown, five, six hundred a day sometimes, and certainly at the start of the year, regularly a couple of hundred um, on busy periods of time. So you can see those have dropped off um, significantly and we're getting around about five a day now on average. Um, so that's not all good news. It means that it's, we know that things are still going on and, and, and things aren't being reported to us. Um, but at the same time, we know that actually there has been a, a big reduction in that kind of demand as well. Uh, so alongside that, I suppose it's best, it's good opportunity for me to uh, talk about our enforcement. The fixed penalty notices we give out, we've seen a real dramatic um, reduction in the amount of fixed penalty notices that we're giving out now. So, uh, you know, all of those breaches that we attend, um, they're not always as reported. And likewise, when we get there, we use our discretion as well. It's not always necessary. So the vast majority of the ones we have given out uh, have been in relation to contravention of gatherings indoors. So those people who decide to gather indoors against the law in greater numbers of, than uh, what is permitted within that law. Uh, so that's where we've seen it uh, and the breaches have been spread out by the way all over the county so there's no particular hotspot area that we're seeing it's, it's a real sort of uh, mixture so the risks i guess at the moment for policing and for for covid for us really especially this weekend i'm going to say is the weather you know what we would have seen is mixing outdoors particularly for the football etc tonight um, and what my concern personally is is that this will drive people indoors and i'm asking people now not to do that we know you can go indoors 
um, two households or six people, please don't breach it. it. Don't do it. We've got a lot of additional officers on tonight and we will deal with those COVID breaches where we find them. If you are gathering in excess of what is permitted, remember again, that's six people or two households and the likelihood is you'll get a 200 pound fine. So it's my football analogy now, let's stick to the rules and make sure that the only penalties that are given out are on the pitch and not to you. Um, and then finally for me, a quick note on masks. Um, I think it was widely reported that North Ants Police were one of the first forces to really start enforcing uh, the legislation around the wearing of masks. Uh, and in fact, at one point, I know that we were um, probably second only to British Transport Police and probably proportionately the highest in the country. And, and we did this for a reason. We know that the wearing of the mask is, has a significant benefit. It stops the spread of infection. And that's why we do it. So we're starting to get more reports now, though, uh, of people not wearing masks where they should. Other than an exemption, there really isn't any excuse for this now. Most shops and places you do go in, if you've forgotten a mask, there is one there that you can use as well. So please, please remember your mask. It's really important. And again, if you don't, we won't shy away from enforcing it with a fine. We all have a responsibility to protect others. And with the transmissibility, as you've, you've heard uh, uh, in relation to this, you have to do your part. We must continue to do our part. And my part as uh, leading the policing operation will be making sure that if you don't, you're going to get a fine for it. Uh, so as usual, doom and gloom from me, but that's it. So enjoy the weekend and the football responsibly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elliot. Um, okay, so we'll move on to um, Dr. Joanne Watts, if that's okay, Joanne. Thank you. So, um, update from me, I think um, I absolutely echo what Deborah said. The system is very busy as far as health services are concerned, um, but not necessarily with COVID. Obviously, we continue to monitor people with COVID in the community. For those people who are at higher risk, um, you will be offered uh, remote monitoring with pulse oximeters in order to try and keep people out of hospital. But actually, it's a lot of other conditions. So there are a lot of other health seeking behaviours. Um, and as Deborah has said, uh, there are some things that it's really important not to forget community pharmacy. Um, really important. They are an extremely useful source of information um, and 111 as well. Um, so it's important to remember that GP surgeries are still there. Um, my top tip for you would be if you don't have to contact a GP surgery on a Monday, choose another day. It's a very busy day of the week. Um, so if you want some practical advice, of how to contact your surgery and also remember that there are other professionals other than GPs there so a lot of surgeries have first contact physiotherapists and social prescribers um, and we are seeing a lot of people who need that reconnection um, with the rest of society and you can call your GP surgery and ask for a social prescriber particularly if you're feeling lonely if you're not sure what's going on if you want reconnecting with society um, they are fantastic individuals and they will really support you our GP surgeries have continued to be open throughout the pandemic um, and we are now seeing approximately 17,000 appointments a day in general practice across our system. So huge volume of activity, 60% of that is currently face-to-face -face consultations and we know that our patients also appreciate uh, remote consultations as well. Um, a lot of the routine health checks are happening and that's one of the ways that you can keep yourself healthy so that you don't end up needing to go to hospital is make sure that some of the things that you might have done to neglect yourself um, go when you're invited whether it's a diabetes check or a high blood pressure check make sure that you get those checks done um, and when you do contact your GP surgery if you are asked to go in face to face or if you need to drop something off um, please do remember to wear a mask it's really important to protect um, other patients and also to protect yourself as well and one of the things that we've seen across the whole system and this is hospital community and general practices we do really appreciate it when the general public are kind to public sector staff um, people have all been having a really difficult year it's not just the health and care staff um, but i would urge people to be kind to be tolerant um, it is really difficult to continue to look after people um, and unfortunately a lot of our health and care professionals have faced significant abuse from the general public um, and it's not a situation that we can tolerate uh, we know you're going through difficult times but please don't abuse the health and care workers who are trying their very best to help you in difficult circumstances the demand has increased. We know it is difficult to get some of the health um, needs that, that you would have previously have had looked after. And we really appreciate your patience and your kindness. Um, and really thank you for everybody who has been so kind to health and care professionals um, and continues to do so. Thank you, Joanne. 
Okay, so that finishes uh, the first part where we hear from the panel. So we'll move on to um, some questions, the pre-submitted questions we'd have, we've had from media colleagues. So the first one is from Global Media. So I'll read this one out. So um, basically it says, um, Corby is shown to have one of the lowest percentages of 50 year olds in their area having both jabs. Um, what can be done to improve that number? And secondly, uh, with the 18s, and over now being invited to book their COVID jabs, will the vaccination programme keep with its current mix in North France of the mass vaccination centres, GPs and some pharmacists? Or will there be an increase in hours, locations, non-booking appointments at the mass vaccination centres to get as many remaining adults vaccinated as soon as possible? So I think um, Anna uh, basically answered some of those. But Anna, do you want to respond to some of these questions? Uh, to yeah. these questions, if that's OK? Yeah, thank you, councillors. Uh, certainly. So, so we want to make sure everybody has the best opportunity possible um, to get their vaccine, both first jabs and second. Um, so we are already offering, as I've referred to earlier, some increased flexibility around drop-in. Um, we are operating some extended hours already, certainly at the vaccination centre at the weekends and also across some um, primary care sites and pharmacies. Um, and over the next month or so, we're, we're exploring ways that we can increase that even further so you will see and the community will see more opportunities to access out of hours um, so across the county we've we've got some really good um, you know we've got some really good coverage in terms of first and second but we do know that there are pockets where we need to push harder so we continue to um, put the message out there as well that it's really important to have that second vaccine um, and with the new cohorts coming on board to go and get firsts um, so a lot of it is around public messaging as well as around um, accessibility and how having the right venues in place. Um, Corby specifically, as I said, we've got the new site opening at the Raven Hotel. So we've got a real focused approach there on, inc on increasing the opportunity for, um, for people to come forward. Thank you, Anna. So the next question is from Kate Cronin from Northampton Telegraph. I understand Kate can't be with us, um, but I will read the questions out. The first one is to Lucy, I think. So the first question is, can you give us some of the reasons why cases um, right, case rates are so low in North Ants compared to the rest of the country and do you expect in a surge in cases as has been witnessed elsewhere? Lucy, are you okay to respond to that? Absolutely. So uh, we think there's an, a number of reasons and obviously we unpick the epidemiology, as you know, locally, um, both with our environmental health experts. We work with the school cell, the adult social care cell to understand the behaviours. We work with Public Health England to understand the behaviours locally and elsewhere as well. We think there's a couple of reasons. So one is obviously we have been an area that's had a lot of focus from a point of view of we had very large outbreak last year. We then had three areas on the chief medical officer's watch list for a period. And then obviously post Christmas, we've had that sort of, you know, onward and, and quite continuous transmission in Corby until recently. So we have had concerted efforts locally to make sure that we've engaged with the communities. We understand what barriers there may be to them, you know, following restrictions and or adhering to isolation requirements, for example. We've worked tirelessly with our comms colleagues and our community engagement leads and our COVID community champions to make sure that we're reaching out to as many parts of our communities as possible to help them understand what the requirements are and to support them to be compliant. Our EHOs have worked tirelessly with our businesses, you know, as has um, all of our school teachers and our head teachers worked with our school cell etc. So I think there's been a focus on us as a geography where obviously that's meant that we have had to very much work with our communities to understand and support them to be as compliant as possible. And, and we are reaping the reward of that to some extent, but kid ourselves not, you know, we do have the Delta variant in our county. We are seeing case rates go up. We've seen that big leap in Northampton and, and West Northampton in particular. Um, and, you know, we obviously do recognize there's some element of geographic um, variation here as well so we, we have seen previously where actually we had less restrictions prior to Christmas for example other areas went up our curve then actually was just a bit later than others so I don't think we've escaped this but I think certainly the additional focus that we've had recently has meant that our communities do understand what's required to keep case rates low and then secondly as I said although we do have 
the Delta variant, we have been less affected by it to date, but it could just be that we're slightly behind a curve that could increase that we've obviously seen go up sooner in other areas. So not out of the woods yet, but I just reinforce the fact that people know what the right thing to do is, and we're just urging them to obviously to continue to do so. Thank you, Lucy. And the second part of the question is, do you have any concerns over the relatively low vaccine uptake in Corby? Is the distance that people have to travel to Moulton to receive their vaccination a factor? Well, you'd like to comment on that and I could perhaps ask Anne if you'd like to add to it. Yeah, so um, I think there is an element of, of travel. We know not everybody has access to their own transport or indeed um, public transport. And we do recognise that, you know, we have a long, thin county and therefore some people may have further to travel than others to uh, visit any of our vaccination sites. We recognise that as a challenge. Um, we obviously are trying to make sure that we've got as many accessible sites as possible. And I think those community pharmacy sites are making a big difference. Um, I think as well, if we're honest, we know that um, there is a link between areas with higher rates of deprivation and then lower rates of vaccination. And that's something that we've seen across the country. So again, we're just trying to make sure that the reasons for vaccination are fully understood by everybody, you know, and, and any concerns or, you know, hesitancy that they've got um, is addressed as well. So this is about not just physical access, but also a willingness and a desire to, um, you know, engage with this process because they recognise the benefit. Thank you, Lucy. Anna, did you want to comment on that point at all? Um, sorry, no, I think really just to echo what, what Lucy said, I mean, the other thing we're going to be looking at is whether there's more opportunity to provide pop-ups, so to take it closer, to take the vaccine even closer to people, so we're, um, we're going to be scoping some of that out next week. Brilliant. Thank you, Anna. So the next question is from Kevin Nichols from Northampton Chronic and Echo. Kevin, did you want to uh, read out your question and we'll direct it to one of our colleagues? Thank you very much, Councillor Goldie, for very kind of you. Um, yes, yeah, so there's a couple of things I was interested in. Um, firstly, uh, regarding the number of patients currently in hospital. Um, I think uh, Deborah Needham said it was four. When I checked on Tuesday, it was five. So hopefully that's, uh, that's good news. Um, I just wonder if there's any way you can tell us if the majority of these have, have received any vaccination doses um, or not, and, and if they are broadly from younger age groups or from older age, age groups as it was in the uh, first part of the pandemic. Um, and just also the uh, town of Dorothy, if I may. Um, the government's uh, aiming to vaccinate, uh, offer a vaccination uh, to everybody over 18 by July the 19th. I just wonder, using your crystal ball, um, if you... I, Obviously, you have an aspiration to for 100%. I just wonder if there's an expectation of a figure that you might be looking at of how many might be done by then. Okay, thank you, Kevin. So we'll go to Deborah first for the first part question, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Uh, so of the four patients that we've got in at the moment, they are in the younger age category. I think that's um, important. And um, I can't give you specific information, but what I can say is they haven't all had their but double vaccines. Thank you. And we'll go to Anna on the crystal ball point, if that's OK. Yes, of course. Um, as you might expect, we've been asked to plan in, in uh, great detail um, how we're going to achieve that um, and what the trajectory for that looks like. So we've done that planning. And we're absolutely um, aiming for and confident that we can um, that we can reach the reach the goal. Thank you, Anna. Kevin, are you okay with those answers, or did you, did you want to ask? No, no, else? absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Brilliant. Thank you. So next, we'll go to uh, Laura Kofi from BBC Radio Northampton. Laura, are you okay to run through your questions? Okay, I don't know if we've got Laura. I, I, I can't check to see if Laura's on the line, but I'll ask them anyway. She's there, yes. Um, I don't know whether she's having a problem on meeting. We'll give her a couple of seconds. She just put in the chat she was having audio issues. Ah, okay. Do you mind reading them out? Yeah, of course not. Of course not. Okay, so from Laura at BBC Radio Northampton. Uh, first question How many people in hospital with COVID? How many people are, are in hospital with COVID? Um, and are already in ICU. Um, so that'll be to uh, Deborah. 
and then to uh, public health vaccine uh, colleagues. Uh, BBC understand vaccines will be compulsory for care home staff. How many care home staff will this affect and how many haven't had the jab compared to how many have? So the first point um, will go to Deborah, if that's okay. How many people in hospital with COVID? I think you did go through that earlier, but um, if you just want to um, reaffirm that. Yeah, absolutely. So it's four at the moment, and one of those is in, in critical care. Um, and as I was saying, they are all in the younger age category. So all are below 50 years old. Um, and I think what's really important here is we very different to the previous uh, previous waves of COVID in terms of age groups of admission. So if you are in the younger age group and you have not had your vaccine yet, then please do go and get it because you uh, this uh, this virus does not uh, does not uh, stop affecting everybody. So uh, really important that you go and have it your vaccine. Thank you, Deborah. And then the point on um, care home staff, I understand we haven't been able to get anybody um, from the adult social care um, team, but um, I think Lucy, you've got some comments on this question. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously we, we, we recognise um, the, the requirement that's now obviously going to be put in place with regard to ensuring that our care home staff are vaccinated. Um, of the 7,842 care home staff that um, we are aware of in, in the county, um, from a point of view of, of we have a local care home sort of tracker that, that looks at all sorts of COVID related data, we've had 6,304 have had one of their doses and um, 5,015 have had their second, so around 1,200. Um, staff. Um, there are around 267 staff where we're still chasing that information, but around 1,200 uh, staff that have yet to be vaccinated. Now, obviously, just to point out that that will be in some cases because people have preferred to wait for their age group eligibility um, because of some of the, the changes around the recommended vaccination for different age groups. Um, but we also do have to recognise that, as we've talked about before, there is some, still some hesitancy and therefore we're going to be working with our adult social care staff, our content engagement teams to make sure that people you know, understand the benefits, that we can answer any questions they may have about any concerns to do with the vaccination. And obviously our approach will be absolutely to encourage people voluntarily to undertake that vaccination first and foremost, rather than sort of go in with um, a, a demand for that to be a requirement. So we want people to be satisfied and happy that this is the right thing to do and it is a safe thing to do. Thank you, Lucy. I hope that answers um, Laura's questions. So that comes to the end of the um, pre-submitted questions. I just wondered if there's any um, press uh, media colleagues um, would like to ask anything else, if you could just um, stick your hand up or put something in the chat, um, or just give you a chance to do that if you, if you would like to. Oh, here we go. So we've got Stuart Ratcliffe. Hi, Stuart. Hi, thank you for letting me put a question in. Um, I know you were talking about uh, all the new drop-in centres and making it easier for people to access vaccination centres, but we were doing a report earlier on in the week about low uptake in the under 30s. I just wondered whether that was uh, something you'd seen in Northamptonshire, so I guess that's a question to Anna, to, in terms of vaccine hesitancy in younger age groups. Yeah, sure. Anna, would you like to comment on that? And then perhaps maybe Lucy might like to add something. Yeah, of course. Actually, you know, we're seeing a really good uptake um, in the under 30s. The message is getting out there. It's um, availability for some of them. I was just going to pull the figure um, back out, actually, for uh, the, the, that age group. Um, so actually, our 30 to 34 um, age category is at 60. 5%, 35 to 39 is at 72%. So we're making progress and very quickly. I think what we acknowledge is that our approach, um, we've had to change our approach and we'll continue to change our approach um, in terms of encouraging younger people to come forward to their vaccine. And some of that's just about how we, how we offer it. So hence the, the drop-in approach. There's also something different we need to do about how we um, how we engage the age group. So it's using different kinds of social media, for example, um, to reach out. So we're doing lots of work with our comms team and getting support from them to, to use TikToks and Instagram and, and uh, things that I don't always uh, know and fully understand. <laughs> um, so, so we're just 
you know, we're just changing our approach a little bit with that. But, but you know, we're pleased with the progress that we're making so far um, and, and excited. We've seen young people come through today into the drop in 18 year olds who are um, selfieing themselves. They're sharing it on social media. So um, I think this is a real age group that will help to sell it to to one another. And, and, and there's some great peer influence that's really positive there as well. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. Lucy, did you want to comment on that as well, or has Anna covered it there? Anna covered it beautifully, thank you. Yeah, you okay with that, Ms Stuart? Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Laura, your hand's up. Um, are you able to speak this time? Yeah, I am. I've, I've logged in on another device. Um, so thank you for the answers to my previous questions. Um, in the coming days, it's expected that UK vaccine experts will recommend to not vaccinate all 12 to 17 year old children against COVID. Now for a number of weeks, I think since kind of March time when the schools went back, this age group has had the largest number of positive tests uh, in the county. If this age group isn't vaccinated, is this just one of those things that we're just going to have to live with, that we will continuously see positive cases in this age group, because this is where the, the virus can spread? Should we go to Lucy first? Yeah, happy to. And then, and then Paul may want to add something about settings or, or indeed Joe um, from, from a clinical perspective as well. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you know, we've obviously yet to wait for the final decision on this. Um, and this is always about um, a risk benefit balance. Any clinical decision is, is made about that. Uh, we know that from trials that, you know, that, that the vaccine is deemed to be safe. But as I said, when actually it comes to providing any kind of medication, vaccination, anything else, um, if it's not absolutely necessary, we would always want um, to not have to do it. With children, I think the key thing is that even when they're infected, there has been so very little um, so you, general illness and certainly very, very little mortality associated with it. That again, you know, they're just trying to make sure that, that, that they look at that risk balance. What is going to be key though, because we recognize they are super spreaders, our young ones, um, is that we need to make sure that we've got a certain level of vaccination coverage in the rest of the population. So that when they're transmitting it, that anybody who may then be infected has got the protection of the vaccination behind them. So they are unlikely themselves to end up with, you know, particularly uh, severe symptoms or indeed hospitalization. So it will be linked to the levels of vaccine uptake that we see in the wider population as well, that decision-making process. Um, the one thing I, I would add as well is that um, you know we, we're doing really well from a point of view of as I said we know that there, there's high case rates but we know we test more so that you know they, they are kind of cause and effect to a point there um, but we also know that our settings are really secure and they're working really really hard to ensure that any positive cases obviously are dealt with really really well and again our recent outbreak uh, you know records demonstrate how effectively they are doing that so even where there is infection um, we're obviously seeing less transmission both within that school setting and also to the wider population. So I think it's a good news story overall, but obviously we'll wait to see what the final, final decision is. Thank you, Lucy. Paul, did you want to comment um, from the school cell point of view? No, I think I think it's more of a medical issue. So I think if that, that's OK, I'll, I'll, I'm happy for Lucy to have taken that. Yeah, sure, sure. OK, is there any other comments on this from any other colleagues? OK. Uh, Joanne, like, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, so what I would say is that I, I completely agree with Lucy and we are fortunate in that if ever there is anything fortunate is that this is a mild disease for the majority of children. What I think is really important to mention to the public is about which test you do when a child has symptoms and this is causing a lot of confusion for my patients. Um, so lateral flow tests are, are for people with no symptoms, they are your regular test that check you're okay, that protect the people around you. If you have symptoms where you think you might have COVID, and I've said it before, um, you wouldn't know, and when people say to me, it's not that COVID cough, it might be that COVID cough. When you have those symptoms, you need to do a PCR test, and that's the one you get uh, by contacting 119 um, or, or going online, and that's how you get those tests. So it's really important that you do a PCR test um, because it is critically important that we detect all of the COVID that is there so that those people can isolate, they don't spread it to those 
people who are vulnerable and those people don't get very unwell with it. So the really important thing with children who have, have a potential COVID infection is to make sure that we recognize it and that you do a PCR test for a child with viral symptoms, um, not a lateral flow test. And we still have people who are going out and about because they've got negative lateral flows. It's not good enough if you have symptoms. So really important we recognize it. Fortunately, it's pretty mild. Um, but as Lucia said, what we need to do is to wrap a, a, a circle of immunized adults around each of those children so that even if they have their mild COVID infection, there are no vulnerable adults who they can inf infect. And it is really important that all those adults, particularly those coming into contact with children, do take the opportunity to get both vaccinations. But I would urge people to get the right test and know which test it is you need to have done. And if you have symptoms, it is a PCR test that you need to do. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Laura, is there anything you'd like to come back on there? There is just a follow up and actually this one might be for, for Paul. Um, just what impact does this, would this potentially have on education? Obviously, we know when um, school, when the remote working was happening and, and uh, children weren't in school that they were having this. And if they do test positive, they have to isolate and obviously they, they still are given schoolwork and things, but what is that kind of long, what does he think this long-term impact could be? Come on then, Paul. Yeah, uh, thanks, Councillor Gulby. Um, thanks, Laura. Um, I think it's really difficult to say because I think it, it will depend largely on um, the government approach at the time. And I think we've, if we're looking towards September, it's very difficult to understand exactly the isolation rules and the social distancing rules that are going to be in place. Um, clearly with, with young people, part of the, the issue, I think the complication for those making this difficult decision is the ethical thing. So are we asking young people to be vaccinated for themselves or are we asking them to be vaccinated for us um, to protect the rest of us? Now, from a medical point of view, I think it's fairly clear that we'd be asking it for, for, for the rest of us. I, and I guess the, question, the other question that needs to be answered, um, and again, it's one for scientists and the government to answer is, what is the, is the educational impact? And that's why I say, without knowing the government plans for um, schools and um, the system of controls they're going to put in schools in September, it's very difficult for me to answer that question. Um, but it is one that I, we, I think we've all thought about a lot, but I, I can't give you any more than that, I'm afraid. Okay, Laura. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, well, I think nobody else has indicated um, to ask any questions. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of this session, if that's okay. So um, I'll thank all panel colleagues that have um, taken time out of their days and, and the really important job that, that you're doing. Um, thank you for uh, coming along and um, helping us out this afternoon. My view of um, how Northamptonshire has responded right from the very start is that, you know, I think we've always been on it and, uh, on, and, and ahead of the curve. And I'm really proud of, you know, the work that everybody has done. Um, so, you know, there's some really strong messages um, in there from all of the uh, panellists this afternoon. And um, Lucy asked me to remind everybody that um, the video will be uploaded to YouTube um, not long after we close down this afternoon. So just to thank everybody again, thank um, press and media colleagues for attending. I hope this has been useful. And um, We've got the announcement again, um, hopefully before we step right down um, in a few weeks time. So I think what the plan is to maybe have another session just before then um, to give everybody a final update on where we are. But um, thank everybody for their time and um, I wish you well and have a good weekend. And let's hope the football goes well. Cheers. Thank you. Bye now.